وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله الذي شرح صدور أوليائه بالإيمان وفتح لهم أبواب النصوص بقواعد البيان وصلى الله وسلم على من أنزل الله عليه الكتاب والميزان وعلى آله وصحابته ومن تبعهم بإحسان أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى We're going to now go into the second chapter in the kitab al-usul min ilm al-usul written by Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymi rahimahu Allah ta'ala after the author rahimahu Allah spoke about al-usul usul al-fiqh what it means and he gave the definition for it he now goes into the second chapter which is al-ahkam rulings in the sharia and inshallah ta'ala here we're going to take two things in this chapter, we're going to be covering and studying two things, inshallah ta'ala. The first thing is definition of al-ahkam. What does al-ahkam actually mean? We're going to take the linguistic and the technical definition, inshallah ta'ala. What does the word al-ahkam mean in the Arabic language? And what does it also mean according to the usuliyin, the scholars of usul al-fiqh? What do they understand from the word? Uh, Al-Ahkam. The second thing that we're going to do is, inshallah ta'ala, in this chapter, is the types of rulings in the Sharia, meaning the types of Al-Ahkam. The types of Al-Ahkam. And Al-Ahkam is rulings of the Sharia. How many types are there? We will take them, inshallah ta'ala. Let's start with the first uh, point, uh, Al-Ahkam. Before I go into the first point, I wanted to say, why did the author choose to speak about al-ahkam? Why did he specifically choose to start uh, the second chapter with al-ahkam? After he chose to define usul al-fiqh, why did he start with al-ahkam? The reason is because um, we mentioned in our last lesson that usul al-fiqh means what? Usul al-fiqh is a science where the person will research into the general evidences. It's a ilm yubhatu an adillati al fiqh al ijmaliya. The person will research inside it the general evidences. And the general evidences is the means in which a person will extract rulings in the sharia. Ah. So that's why he chose to make the first chapter after defining usul al fiqh the definition of al-ahkam. And so you can't do istimbat, you can't extract what you haven't perceived and what you haven't understood. So that's why he chose to start with al-ahkam al-shari'ya, the rulings in the sharia. So the author, rahimahullah, he said, al-ahkam jam'u hukmin wa huwa lughatan al-qada. Al-ahkam, rulings, is the plural of hukm and linguistically means a judgment. So the word al-ahkam is plural. And the singular of it, the singular of it is what? Hukum. We mentioned before that the Arabic plural is three types. Masculine plural, feminine plural, and broken plural. Broken plural. Al-ahkam is the third type. It's the broken plural. And the singular of the word al-ahkam is hukum. What does it mean in the linguistic usage? I mean, what is it in the linguistic usage? It is, as the author said, al-qada. So the author said that the word al-ahkam, I mean, the word hukum in the Arabic language, it means al-qada. And qada means to judge between two people. And that usage that the author used doesn't seem to be accurate. Because the correct definition linguistically for the word hukum is al-man'u is to prevent and stop something one of the words that are used in the arabic language which comes from the same root as the word hukum is hikmah 
Hikmah means wisdom. And what's the definition of al-hikmah? It is, هِيَ وَضْعُ الشَّيْءِ فِي مَوْضِعِهِ It is to place something in its correct place. Meaning, you know when to speak and you know when to be silent. You know when to speak and how to speak and, what, what, and how to get that point across in the uh, best way. So you're a person who is hakim, wise. Why is it called hikmah? Why does it use the same root word as the word hukum? Scholars, they said it's because the word hikmah, it prevents the person, which is referred to the hakim, the wise person, it prevents him from falling into mistakes. Tamna'uhu, tamna'u al-hakima min al-wuqu'i fi al The person won't fall into a mistake. Meaning he knows when to speak and he knows when not to speak. He knows when he chooses to speak, how to speak. He knows who he's talking to. Everything for him goes in the right place. Okay? He doesn't go forward unless he thinks there's a need for it. And he doesn't go and hold, hold back unless he feels there, there is a, a benefit or a need in it. So the hakim is the same root word as the word hukum. And it means al manu We've understood that, right? Walidalika the Arab poet he said, Abani Hanifata Ahkimu Sufahaakum Inni Akhafu Alaikum and Aghdaba. He said Abani Hanifata. The alif in Abani Hanifata, that alif, it's standing in the position of Harfun Nida, the ya. Meaning, Ya Bani Hanifata, O oh, the people of Bani Hanifa, Ahkimu Sufahaakum. Stop your dim witted ones. So he used the word Ahkimu. And what does he mean by it? He means imna'uhum, stop them. Stop your dim-witted ones. Why? Inni akhafu alaykum an aghdaba. I'm scared that I might become angry with you guys. And then that might lead to a problem. So now that you guys have the chance, grab the hands of your dim-witted one and stop them. So he used the word ahkimu sufaha'akum. Ahkimu here means, he means hold them back. So the word hukum, it means what? To hold back, to prevent. As for the author saying that it means in the Arabic language judging, then that's not accurate because judging it does it can be used for it, but that's not the that's not the asal meaning that it goes back to. The real meaning that it goes back to is to prevent. Because when you judge between two people, you're preventing them from both oppressing one another. What are you doing? You're all يَمْنَعُ الْخُصُومَ مِنَ التَّظَالُمِ The Qadi, when he judges, what is he preventing? That they don't oppress one another. And that's why when Allah used it in the ayah, وَإِنَّ حَكَمْتَ فَحْكُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْقِصْدِ And that, that generally happens a lot when it comes to translations of terms. You find that people do it a lot. Like for example, people say, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ Those of you who believe in Allah, fear Him. The word taqwa doesn't mean fear. Taqwa doesn't mean fear. And you find people translate it to be fear. Are they wrong in doing so? No. Why? Taqwa actually means just to take a shield. And generally what you take a shield from, and you prevent yourself from, is you're concerned and you're worried and you're scared that it might what? It might come your way. So taqwa means take a shield from the hellfire. Take a shield from the anger and the wrath of your Lord. That's what taqwa means. But when people translate it or explain it, they say, Ya ayyuladina amal taqwa. Fear Allah. That's not wrong. But it's tafsiru shay'i. It's, defi- it's translating a word based on what it's going to lead to. Taqwa leads to the fear of Allah. The fear of Allah falls under taqwa. Like it is not tafsiru al That's a side point. Then the author now goes into the technical definition of the word al ahkam. What does he do? He goes into the technical de- de- definition of the word al-ahkam and he says rahimahullah wastilahan maqtadahu khitabu al-shar'i al-muta'alliqu bi af'ali al-mukallafin min talib aw taqhir aw wad' fa al-murad bi qawlina khitabu al-shar'i al-kitabu wa sunnah wa al-murad bi qawlina al-muta'alliqu bi af'ali al-mukallafin ma ta'alliqa bi a'malin sawa'un am sawa'an whichever way you want to say it kanat qawlan am fi'la ijadan am tarka fa kharaja bihi ma ta'alliqa bi al-i'tiqad fa la yusamma hukman bi al istilah والمراد بقولنا المكلفين ما من شأنه التكليف فيشمل الصغير والمجنون والمراد بقولنا من طلب الأمر والنهي على سبيل الإلزام أو الأفضلية والمراد بقولنا أو تخيير المباح والمراد بقولنا أو وضع 
الصحيح والفاسد ونحوهما مما وضعه الشارع من علامات ووصاف للنفوذ والإلغاء Al-Ahkam rulings is the plural of hukam and linguistically means a judgment which has been necessitated by the speech of the legislator relating to the actions those burdened with carrying out the obligation of the legislation and mukallifin are mandated either by request or choice or state. The intent behind our saying the speech of the legislator is the Quran and the Sunnah. The meaning of our words relating to the actions of those burdened with carrying out the obligation of the legislation is what is connected to actions, whether in word or deed, to do something or leave it. So this excludes whatever is associated with belief, so it is not called a ruling with regards to this terminology. The meaning of our statement al mukallifin is whoever is included by the process of being burdened to fulfill the obligations of the legislation, which excludes the young and the insane. The meaning of our statement mandated talab is commands and prohibitions whether it be by way of obligation or preference. The meaning of our word choice takhir is in whatever is permissible and what is meant by our word state wada is what is correct or otherwise as dictated by the legislator through signs or descriptions which are to be implemented or cancelled. The author now goes into the definition of al-ahkam the technical definition. We've already done the linguistic definition. What did we say the linguistic definition was? We said it means al-man'u. That's the correct meaning. And that the second meaning that the author gave it, which is al-qada, it goes back to al-man'u. Are you with me? But in fact, there's a great scholar in the Arabic dictionary. He's got a good Arabic dictionary book. Uh, it's called Ibn Faris. He has a kitab called Mu'jam Maqaisu al One of the benefits that that dictionary book has is that if a word has many usages, he will try to find one or two meanings that all the other meanings go back to. He'll try to find the, mo- the bare minimum that, the, word can, that the, the usage of this word can be brought back to. And that book is very good, especially if you're learning the Arabic language. It's called Mu'jam Maqaisul Lugha. So here, when we spoke about Al-Hakam, we brought it only back to one meaning, which is Al-Man'u. Instead of saying that it's two meanings, Al-Man'u wal qada it's better to bring it to one to the bare minimum. After we've spoken about its linguistic usage, the author goes into the technical usage, which is, what does hukum mean according to the people of usul al-fiqh, the scholars of usul al-fiqh? What is their, what is their understanding from usul al-fiqh, uh, sorry, al-ahkam? The usuliyin, the scholars who deal with usul al-fiqh. What does ahkam, ama hukum mean to them? What does a ruling in the Sharia mean to them? What's the definition of rulings in the Sharia? What does it mean according to the Suriyin? The Sheikh, he mentioned it here. He said, Maqtadahu khid. So we're going to cover point by point. Point by point. The first point that the author said is Maqtadahu. The word Iqtadahu means necessitates. And the Sheikh chose to use that particular word. Okay? It is what the Sharia necessitates. Meaning, what the khitabu shara, the speech of the legislator, whatever it necessitates. And the khitabu shara is the what? Quran, Sunnah, uh, the ijma' and the qiyasu sahih. And Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he said khitabu shara is kalamuhu azza wa jalla, Allah's speech. He said khitabu shara is kalamuhu. That the khitabu shara is Allah's speech. But we say that the Quran, Sunnah is in there as well because the Sunnah is from Allah. Okay? Because وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ And the poet, he said, فَالسُنَّةُ النَّبِيِّ وَحْيٌ ثَانٍ That the Sunnah of the Prophet is a second revelation. The consensus is also a proof in our religion. Based on the ayah, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَىٰ وَيَتَّبِعَ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ and the Qiyasu Sahih is a proof. The Qiyasu Sahih, the correct analogy is a proof. And we're going to mention that Qiyasu Sahih is a proof when we come to the, uh, the chapter of Al Qiyas analogy. So let me go back again. What does Hukum mean according to the Usuliyin? It means whatever is necess- necessitated from those four evidences the Quran, the Sunnah, the Ijma'. And the Qiyasu Sahih, whatever is necessitated from it. 
the author chose to use the word maqtada, whatever is necessitated from it. And he didn't just say that the Quran and the Sunnah itself, I mean the khitab al-shara itself is a what? Is a hukum. He didn't say that. He said what is necessitated from it. And the question here is what does that mean? What's the difference between saying that hukum means khitab al-shara المتعلق المتعلقة بأفعال المكلفين من طلب أو تخيير أو وضع and saying مقتضاه what's the difference between saying that the Quran and the Sunnah itself is a hukum or saying what is necessitated from the Quran and the Sunnah is a hukum what's the difference let me repeat that again what is the difference between saying that hukum rulings in the Sharia is what is necessitated from the khitab uh, al the speech of the legislator. That's the first one. The second is that the speech of the legislator itself is a hukum. Itself is a hukum. What's the difference between the two? First of all, this usage of saying necessitated, which is the first one, because some great scholars have said it. Like Al-Futuhi ibn Najjar, he mentions that, Rahimahullah, in his kitab, Mukhtasar al-Tahrir, fi usul al-fiqh. And others have done that. Rather, the overwhelming majority of the fuqaha, jurists, and the, some of the usuliyin, they take the opinion of what Ibn Uthaymin mentioned here, which is that the hukum is what's necessitated from the speech of the legislator. The overwhelming fuqaha and a very small number of usuliyin, that's the view they hold. The second is that the khitab al-shar' itself, the speech of the legislator itself is a ruling and this is a view held by the overwhelming majority of usuliyin. The usuliyin, they believe that the khitab al-shar', the speech of the legislator itself is a ruling. Now, what is, what's the difference between the two? The difference is that Allah said, for example, in the ayah, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Establish the prayer. According to the overwhelming majority of usuliyin, this is a hukum. The ayah itself, the fact that Allah said that, itself is a ruling. It's called a hukum, according to them. Lakin the fuqaha, the jurists, that's not a ruling. It's not a ruling in the sharia. The ruling in the sharia is what's going to be necessitated from the ayah, which is, Allah said subhanahu wa ta'ala, aqimu salah, establish the prayer. And establish the prayer, it's wajib, it's obligatory. And then they believe that the word wajib is the ruling. The word wajib is a ruling. And not the ayah that's the ruling. Meaning what they necessitated from the verse. Also Allah said in the ayah, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina." Don't come close to zina. According to the majority of usuriyin, this is a hukum. As for the fuqaha, they believe Tahrimu zina the fact that zina is haram, which is what's necessitated from the verse, is the ruling. It is the ruling. Again, this is khilafun la yataratabu alayhi thamara. It's a khilaf that no benefit will really come out from it. So it's really not no point in busying yourself discussing it and looking into it too much and researching it because it all comes back to the same whole. It all comes back to the same point. The second part of the definition is khitab al-shara'ah. Khitab al-shara'ah is the kitab and the, and the sunnah. And of course, we put, we put in there as well the ijma' and we also put there in there the qiyas al-sahih. We will put, the, put that in there. And these are adilla mutafakun fi. Adilla which is mu'tabara. Uh, evidences which is given consideration. Evidence which are unanimously agreed upon that they are accepted. The Qur'an, the Sunnah, the Ijma' and the correct Qiyas, the correct analogy. Those are Khitab al-Shara'ah. And Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, he said that the Khitab al-Shara'ah is uh, Allah's speech subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is it that's not in the Khitab al-Shara'ah? What is an, when we say Khitab al-Shara'ah, we mean by the speech of the legislator. What do we not mean by that? What we don't mean is the speech of other than the legislator. So the speech of a master to his slave or a wife to a husband in the Sharia that's not considered what? It's not a considered khitab al-shara'ah. I mean, it's not considered a hukum. It's not a ruling according to them. 
Okay, then it says al mutaalliqu means which is connected to bi af'ali mukallafina. This ruling is connected to the actions of the slave. A ruling in the Sharia is what? It is first point. It is Allah addressing the messenger addressing sallallahu alaihi wasallam that which is taken from the consensus that which has been brought from a correct done uh, analogy okay what is it addressing like in I mean, what is it to, it's addressing and that addressing is connected to what that the khitab this uh, the speech of the legislator is connected to what it is connected to bi af'al al the actions of the mukallafin we're going to speak about what a mukallif, mukallif is. We're going to come to that soon. It is connected to the actions of the mukallafin. Uh, let me just mention it now to make it easier. A mukallaf is a person who's reached age of puberty and has sanity. He's sane and he's reached age of puberty. They call this a mukallaf. So it's connected to the action of the mukallaf. And when we say it's connected to the action of the mukallaf, we mean three things. Three things. Number one is... Uh, that which comes to the mind straight away, which is that which the slave does, his actions. The first one is iqa'atu wa It's what we do. It's connected to your actions, and that's the one that comes to the mind straight away. صح? The second one is the speech of the creation. Fuk you have to pay attention. These scholars they consider a hukum only what's connected to your actions, what's connected to your speech. Your speech, there's rulings that are connected to regarding it. Are we all together? وَلِذَلِكَ اللَّهِ تَبَارَكُ وَتَعَالَى says وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ عَدُوًا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنْسِ وَالْجِنِّ يُوحِي بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَى بَعْضِهُمْ زُخْرُ فَالْقَوْلِ غُرُورًا وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ مَا فَعَلُوهُ فَذَرْهُمْ مَا يَفْتَرُونَ Allah referred to speech as actions. So it falls under there. So it falls under the أَفْعَالِ الْمُكَلَّفِينَ the, sec- the third thing is what? Turuk, that which you leave. The things that you leave is also considered bi af'al al-mukallafina. According to the scholars, what you leave is an action. What you say is an action. And what you do is an action. How is what you say, how, sorry, how is what you left considered an action? Because Allah said in the ayah, وَلَوْلَا يَنْهَاهُمُ الرَّبَّانِيُونَ وَالْأَحْبَالُ عَنْ قَوْلِهِمُ الْإِثْمَى وَأَكْلِهِمُ السُّحْتْ لَبِئْسَ مَا كَانُوا يَصْنَعُونَ Allah said subhanahu wa ta'ala, if only they stop their rabbis and their monks from two things. Two things if they were stopped, would stop them from it. The first one is the evil speech that they came with. And the food and that which they ate, which was haram, if they stop them from those two. And then look what Allah said. What an evil thing that they did. But they didn't do anything. They actually didn't stop those people. So Allah referred to the fact that they did not call to the they didn't prohibit the evil and their, their choice of just holding back and relaxing, Allah referred to that as an action. So not doing anything itself is a, it's an action. It's an action. So pay attention here. The rulings of Allah is connected to your speech. That's a hukum. It is also connected to your actions. It's also connected to your what? What you do. But the rulings according to the Usuliyin is not connected to what you believe. Usuliyin, when they say hukum, they don't, they're not talking about what's in your heart. What's in your heart is spoken about and is discussed in another science called aqidah. Are we all together? According to the Usuliyin, what you believe, that's not a hukum to them. Number two, human essence. Your essence, there's no ruling connected to that. The, flat, the fact that you're white or you're black or you're Chinese or you're this, you're tall, you're short, no ruling is connected to that. Meaning, two people, we don't value one over the other and give superiority to one over the other based on their ethnicity and their background. We don't. We give them value based on their actions. And the action that we value them on is in the three that we just mentioned. What they say, what they do, and what they, what they leave off. وَلِذَلْكَ اللَّهِ سَيْنَ الْيَآيَةِ يَا إِيَا النَّاسُ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرِ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَرَفُوا إِنَّا أَكْرَمَكُمْ إِنَّا أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ The best amongst you is the one who has taqwa. Why? Because the rulings of Allah is not connected to your essence. 
the essence was only made لِتَعَرَفُوا so you can recognize one another not so that you can love one another based on it or you can raise one another based on it or that you can favor one based on it لا. that was only made so you know who this person is and his background and his ethnicity and etc and he can recognize you when he sees you and that's, some people may like this color to get married to and some people might like that color to get married to people have varieties and Allah made that subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah has only mentioned that he created us in different backgrounds and different colors لِتَعَارَفُوا so you can recognize one another but some people today they turned it into لِتَقَاتَلُوا so you can fight one another or that you can hate one another they've changed the verse and they've changed the meaning also the حُكُم according to the usulin is not connected to it is not connected to بِالْمَخْلُوقَاتِ أُخْرَى the other creations out there that's not حُكُم for example when Allah says وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا and stuff like that and other verses that you're going to see in the Quran where Allah talks about the day and the night and the sun and the moon for them this is not حُكُم it's not a ruling these creations this, this is what's connected to them it's not a حُكُم according to the usulin. It's not a usuli, it's not a term. Then the author then said, مَا مِنْ شَأْنِهِ التكليف. And him saying this, rahimahullah, it is ta'arif awsa' than that which we have mentioned. Shaykh Mul Uthaymeen is saying, rahimahullah, that the hukum, is can, these rulings of Allah, is not only connected to what? The mukallaf. Okay, it's not only connected to the mukallaf. It's also connected to what? It's connected to any individual whose one time and the possibility of being a mukallaf is there. And so the saghir and the majnoon, are in, they enter into here. He wants to bring them in. Because the child who's born, is he mukallaf? Is he burdened? Does he have to pray? No, he doesn't have to pray. Shaykh Ibn Uthameen is saying like in, the hukum, he still falls under it, maybe not now, but it's, it's hovering over his head. It's there. The minute he takes on puberty, the ruling comes into place. The one who's insane, the minute the sanity comes back, the ruling is on him. So he used a more vaster uh, definition, rahimahullah ta'ala. So the taklif is two types here, that's what he's trying to say. Taklifun fil hali and taklifun fil ma'ali. There's a person who's mukallaf right now. There's another person who's mukallaf in what? Fil ma'ali in the future. He's going to become mukallaf once, one, point, one, one, one time in his life. He's going to be mukallaf one time. Um, some of the scholars, they change the word mukallaf and they use the word ibad. Instead of mukallaf, they just use the word ibad, slaves. Because that then encompasses everybody. The child is a slave of Allah, is he not? Of course. So they use the word ibad, and I think that is better to be used. That is better be, to be used. The reason why it's better to be used is because it is um, a term used by Allah. And it's also a term that fulfills the definition correctly. Then the author, rahimahullah, he said, min talabin. This min here is bayaniya. Uh, this min here grammatically is bayaniya, as it's in the ayah fajtanibu rijsa min al awthani wajtanibu qawl al zur fajtanibu rijsa stay away from rijs min al awthani it's not tab'idiyah don't say some, from some of them it's bayaniya it's to clarify even more for you okay min talabin so how does the hukum come about the hukum comes about in three ways okay this hukum, it occurs and it happens in how many ways? It happens and it occurs in three ways. The first one is talab. Talab means what? You're requested to do something. Or takhirin, the second one is takhir, choice. Or wad'in, or a state. You're in a situation, you're in a state, and there's a ruling connected to that. Those are the three ways that it happens. Let's start with the first one, which is talab. The talab is four types. The request is four types. A is that which the Sharia requests for you, from you to do in a forceful manner. That's the first one. It is what the Sharia requested from you to do in a what? In a forceful manner. The second is 
that which the Sharia requested from you to do in a recommended manner. The third one is that which the Sharia requested from you to leave off in a forceful manner. And the last one which is that which the Sharia requested from you to leave off in a recommended manner. If you look at the four I mentioned, the first one is wajib. And the second one is mandub. And the third one is muharram. And the fourth one is makruh. Four of them, they fall under talab, request. Takhir is choice. And what does it mean, takhir, choice? It means that doing it and leaving off is the same. تجويز للفعل والترك على سواء To do it or to leave it, it's the same. And that one is mubah. That is what? Mubah. And last but not least is a wad. Wad means state. The sharia, it placed a sign. When this sign comes, there is something that you need to now come with. This sign, it's not upon you to bring it about. You're not, you're not forced to bring the sign. And you're not meant to bring about this state. But when it occurs and it happens, there are things that are requested from you. And wada, five things fall under it. Five. Sabab, Sharat, Mani, Siha, and Fasad. And some other scholars, they add even more into it. Uh, Al-Ada and Al-Qada and things like that. And inshallah ta'ala, we're going to speak about all of this in great details. It's going to come to us soon, inshallah ta'ala. Then the author says, Shaykh Muhammad al Musala Uthaymin, he says, أَقْسَامُ الْأَحْكَامِ الشَّرْعِيَّةِ تَنْقَسِمُ الْأَحْكَامُ الشَّرْعِيَّةِ إِلَىٰ قِسْمَيْنِ تَكْلِيفِيَّةِ وَوَضْعِيَّةِ The types of rulings in the Sharia, the types of commands in the Sharia fall into two categories, تَكْلِيفِيَّةِ and وَضْعِيَّةِ Now we're going to go into the second type, I mean the second point that we wanted to talk about in the chapter. What was the first thing that we said we're going to speak about in this chapter? We said we're going to talk about the definition of al-ahkam. And did we not do that? We defined ahkam linguistically and technically. Now we're going into the second part of, our, uh, of, of this chapter, which is types of rulings in the sharia. Types of rulings in the sharia. The ahkam of sharia is divided into two. Okay, the first one is taklifiya, and the second one is wadhiya. First is what taklifiya, and the second one is wadhiya. This categorization, it's the view of the overwhelming majority of the usuliyin. They're the ones who divide the ahkam sharia into wadhiya and taklifiya. Like in some scholars, some usuliyin. They don't categorize it into two, they categorize it into three. Like Saif al Amidi, this Kitab al Hikam, fi Usul al Hikam. He categorized it into three. He added an extra one, which the author didn't mention here, which is Takhiri. He called it Takhiri. So he said there are three Taklifi, Takhiri, and Wad'i. And the reason why he did that is because he wanted to take the Mubah out of the Taklifi. He wanted to take the mubah out of the taklifi and he wanted to make it a separate entity, a separate type of categorization. And we're going to see later the reason why Saif al Amidi did that is because what is taklifi? Taklifi is a what? It's a talabu fi'lin or talabu tarkin. You're either requested to do something or you're requested to leave off something. And mubah is a is it a request to do something or to leave off something? No, it's not. So he thought that it was better to take it out of taklifi and to place it in what? And give it its own categorization, which is takhiri. The third one is al wadi Wadi, we already mentioned it. It means that the sharia places a sign, a sign. What does it do? It places a sign. And you're not obliged to come with this sign. This sign only indicates that you have to do something, but it, it is not upon you to come with it. And we'll take that in great details, inshallah ta'ala, soon. 
Sayf al-Amidi's taqseem is better. Sayf al-Amidi's taqseem is better than the taqseem that is done by the overwhelming majority of usuliyin. But either way, this is again those kind of discussions which is لا ثمرة تحته. There's nothing really that va- no, you're not going to take a lot out of it by learning why is mubatik put under hakam al wudhiya and why shouldn't it be in there and etc. You're not going to benefit much from it. So it's one of those things that you shouldn't busy yourself with. Then the author رحمه الله he said فالتكليفية خمسة الواجب والمندوب والمحرم والمكروه والمباح The taklifiya are five. Wajib, obligation, mandub, encouraged to undertake, muharram, prohibited, makruh, disliked, and mubah, permissible. The author, rahimahullah, he now goes into the first type of rulings in the sharia. We said that the rulings of the sharia are categorized into two, wad'iyya, uh, taklifiya and wad'iyya. The author now is going to the first one, which is taklifiya. He said that the taklifiyya are five. And he started with al-wajib, and then he said al-mandub, and al-muharram, and al-makruh, and al-mubah. Each one, we're going to take their linguistic and technical meaning and matters related to it, inshallah ta'ala. But what the author did here is, he, that he took the categorization and he took the... Um, the method of the Jumhur, the overwhelming majority of Usuliyin, which is to categorize the taklifiyah into those five. But the author, the order that he did it in, isn't the best. The author, the, the order in which he did it in, isn't the best order. Meaning he started from Al-Wajib, and then he did Al-Mandub, and then Muharram, and Al-Makruh, and Al-Mubah. What would have been better is, for him to start from min al a'la ila al adna. For him to start from the highest of those five and then make his way to going down the ladder. So he would say, for instance, al wajib, wal mandub, wal mubah, wal makruh, wal muharram. In that order, the highest being al wajib. And then after wajib is mandub. And then next to mandub is al mubah. And then is al makruh and then al muharram. That sequence is better because it's the highest to the lowest. The Shaykh rahimahullah ta'ala, he didn't use the terms in the method that is used by the usuliyin, because this subject is usul al fiqh. The scholars of usul al fiqh, they don't say, Al-Wajib and Al-Mandub and uh, Al-Mubah and Al-Makruh and Al-Muharram. They don't say that. They say Al-Ijab, Al-Nadb, Al-Ibaha, Al-Karaha, Al-Tahrim. They use it in that way, in that way I just said it. And the author didn't use that ta'bir, that method, that way. He didn't articulate it in that way. And... The reason why he would do that is because his definition of hukum was what? What was the definition that Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih Uthaymin chose? He chose to define it based upon whose way? The way of the fuqaha. Which was what? Maqtabahu khitabu sharah. What is necessitated from the speech of the legislator. The ruling, remember when we were talking about ruling in the sharia? Shaykh ibn Uthaymin's definition of hukum ruling was what? His definition of ruling was maqtadahu khitabu shar'i It is what is necessitated from the speech of the legislator. And not the legislation speech itself is not a ruling to him or to his definition. So because that being the case, he wouldn't use the word al-ijab because al-ijab is used for when you are describing the speech or the ruling of the legislator. And um, when you use wajib, you're describing the action of the mukallaf. So that's why he would use that 
Ta'bir. Ala kulli hal, the scholars of Usul al-Fiqh, they permit both ways. This five categorization of Ahkam al-Taklifiyyah, this five categorization, these five types of Ahkam al-Taklifiyyah, the Ahnaf, the Hanafi, the Hanafiyyah, they add two extra onto that five. And they say, Al-Fardu wal karahatu karahatu tahrim They believe that. They believe there is a two extra additional types that need to be added. The first one is Al-Fardu and Al-Makru karahatu tahrim Those are the two that they say that should be added onto the Ahkamu Taklifiyya, the Hanafiyya. Why did they add these two? Why would they add these two? The Hanafis, they looked at the wajib and they said that the wajib and the fard are two different things. According to the other jumhur, the, the overwhelming majority of Usuriyin and the fuqaha, they believe wajib and fard are synonyms. They're the same. Like in the Hanafiya, they said no. They said no. The wajib and the fard are not the same. Why is it not the same? They said we need to look at quwwatu tariq, the way in which it came to us, the way that it it came to us. So yes, the wajib, the Sharia commanded it in a forceful way. Yes, and the fard, the Sharia requested it in a forceful way. Yes, both are the same. Like in the wajib, it came to us through a speculative. A speculative uh, report. Whereas the fard, it came to us in a multitude, certain report. This report has reached certainty. It come to us in a multitude narration, in large number, in large quantity, in large mass. So it is, we're certain about it. So this is called fard. That's what they say the difference is. And then they say the same with uh, the karaha. They say the same with uh, the karaha. The karaha, for them the karaha and the muharram are two different things. Makru, we're talking about it here. Makru, makru karaha to tahrim and the muharram are two different things for them. What is the difference? They say the difference is again, both of them, the sharia, have prohibited them in a forceful manner. But the uh, uh, what do you call it? Muharram has been prohibited in a the prohibition, the way that it's re the report has reached us is qat'iyun bi tariqin qat'i Muharram in a certain report. I mean, the report came through certainty. May maybe for instance, multitude narration, mass number of people have reported this. That's the Muharram. And the Karaha, and the, the Makruh, Karaha to Tahrimna, it is something that the Sharia prohibited in a forceful manner, but it didn't come to us and it hasn't reached us uh, in a, uh, a certain, uh, it hasn't reached us with true certainty. So it's based upon Dhanni speculation. And some of the scholars, they said that this, and this is غير واحد من الأصولين, more than one scholar of Usul al Fiqh, they said, that this is khilaf lafzi. This is difference of wordings only. Okay? It's just difference of wordings. As we would say in English, tomato and tomato. However you want to say it. It's just the same. The essence, lakin, it's what? It's one. And one of the great scholars that went into details by that is Ibn al-Laham al-Hanbali. He has a long discussion regarding it in his al -Qawaid. And other scholars have spoken about it. So according to the Hanafis, how many Ahkam al are there? Seven. Al-Fardu, Wal-Wajib, Wal-Mandub, Wal-Mubah, Wal-Muharramu, Wal-Makru, Karahat al-Tahrim, and Wal-Makru, Karahat al-Tanzih. Those are the seven. Those are the seven that they have. Then the author, Rahimahullah, he said, فَالْوَاجِبُ لُغَةً أَسَّاقِطُ وَالْلَازِمْ وَاصْطِلَاحًا مَا أَمَرَ بِهِ الشَّارِعُ عَلَى وَجْهِ الْإِلْزَامِ كَصَلَوَاتِ الْخَمْسِ فَخَرَجَ بِقَوْلِنَا مَا أَمَرَ بِهِ الشَّارِعُ المحرم والمكروه والمباح 
وخرج بقولنا على وجه الإلزام المندوب والواجب يثاب فاعله امتثالا ويستحق العقاب تاركه ويسمى فرضا وفريضة وحتما ولازما واجب Linguistically means what has fallen or what is compulsory Technically it means what the legislator has ordered as a matter of obligation like the five daily prayers So excluded from our statement what the legislator has ordered is what is forbidden disliked and permissible and also excluded from the statement by way of obligation is that which is only encouraged mandub therefore something wajib is that which if carried out will bring reward for the one carrying it out and the one that fails to do so deserves to be punished it is also called fard faraida hatman and lazim the author here talks about um, four things now we've already discussed that the ahkam al-takrifiyya are five. He's now going to go into each and every one of those five. The first one was what? Wajib, right? Four points we're going to take, inshallah. How many points are we going to take? We're going to take four points here that the author, rahimahullah, discussed. The first thing is the definition of wajib. And the author gave two linguistic definition of wajib in the Arabic language. According to the Arabs, the word wajib uh, in the Arabic language it is it's two meanings in the Arabic language. The first one is as-saqitu, when something drops. Saqitu means something falls and it drops. And this comes from the ayah, فَإِذَا وَجَبَتْ جُنُوبُهَا Allah is talking about subhanahu wa ta'ala the hadi, the slaughtering of the camel. What does a person do? If you want to slaughter the camel, what do you do? The camel stands on four legs, right? So what do you do to one of the legs? The last one of the legs, you tie it. You tie it. And so what you do is you take that animal from the throat, you slaughter it. Then the animal cannot stand anymore, he falls on the floor, and the nets will go out faster than him. This is to get him to die quicker so he doesn't feel the pain. So Allah said in the ayah, فَإِذَا وَجَبَتْ جُنُوبُهَا When its side falls on the floor. Allah used the word فَإِذَا وَجَبَتْ وَجَبَتْ وَاجِبْ أَيْ سَقَطَتْ When its side falls on the ground. So the first Arabic usage of the word wajib is what? سَاقِطُ When something falls. That's what it means in the ayah. Amma when we say وُجُوبُ الشَّمْسِ Wujubu shamsi, what do we mean by this? I will mean suqutuha when it falls. The second meaning is lazim, which it means, huh? lazim means necessary, something that is mandatory. So, for example, you say, wajab al bay'u, the transaction is obligatory, yeah, it's mandatory. And here it goes back to the second meaning. Here it goes back to which meaning? Al-lazimu, that's the meaning that we're going to be taking from it. Okay? Now we're going to go into the second type of definition. We're going to go into the second type of definition. What does it mean in, according to the usuliyin, the scholars of usul al-fiqh, what do they understand from, uh, I mean, what's the definition of usul, uh, sorry, wajib for them? The word wajib, what does it mean to the usuliyin? It means مَا أَمَّرَ بِهِ الشَّارِعُ عَلَى وَجْهِ الْإِلْزَامِ So we're going to take one by one. The first, the shaykh says مَا The word مَا The reason why the shaykh used the word مَا It's a jins يَدْخُلُ فِيهِ الْحَكَامِ الْخَمْسَ So he used the word مَا So he wants all five of them to enter it. When he says the word مَا It's a jins It's an essence And under it will fall all five. And then he wants to take one out, one out and the other one out. So, so first of all, in a definition, you start general and then you start to do ihtirazat. You start to take out what's not part of it. So ma, whatever. Because the word ma is min adawat al-umum. It shows generalization, right? So ma, all of the hakam al-khamsa, it enters there. Then he says, amar bi shari'i. The shari'i commanded it. Automatically, he took two things out of there. The what? The muharram and the makruh. The sharia didn't command that. When he said, Ma'amara bi sharia, that which the sharia commanded, 
then the makruh and the muharram are not in there no longer. And also what's not in there? What's also not in there? The mubah is not in there. Because the mubah, we said before, it's not a command nor a prohibition. Okay? So three of them dropped. Very good. That's one view. Another view of scholars, they believe that the mubah is a amar. And that's the view that we said that Shaykh Muhammad bin Salih Uthaymin is upon. Are we all together? Because when something is mubah, which is permissible, even if you're not commanded to do that particular thing, you have to believe in your heart the permissibility of it. So you are commanded. Are we all together? Does that make sense? So for him, rahimahullah ta'ala, he still doesn't believe that the Amr has been taken out of, we haven't taken out the word mubah out of the ihtiraz here. Does that make sense? So for him, where will it go out? It will go out in the point after which is ala wati al-ilzam. Am I making sense? The word ma, when you said it, all of the five are in there. When you said ma amara bi shari'u, two of them dropped, which is what? Al-muharram and al-makruh. You're left with what? Just left with one more left, outstanding. So for Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, Amr Abi Shari' the Mubah is still in there. So where did he, how did he take the Mubah out of here? Ala wajhi al-ilzam, he takes it out of there, which is your f- in a forceful manner. You know what? In a forceful, forceful manner. That's a view. Um, so that's the definition of wajib. Wajib means what? مَا أَمَرَ بِهِ الشَّارِعُ عَلَى وَجْهِ الْإِلْزَامِ Whatever the Sharia commanded for you to do in a forceful manner. That's the definition of wajib. And the Sheikh is very, as I said before, he's daqiq. He defined it بِمَاهِيَةِ الشَّيْءِ The real meaning of wajib. He didn't define it as many usuliyin define it as what? مَا يَتَرَتَّبُ عَلَيْهِ That which necessitates from the wajib, which is if you do it, you get rewarded, and if you leave it off, you get punished. That's a definition which is what? That's athar al wajib. I'm a athar al wajib. What necessitates from the wajib once you do it. But that's not the definition of the wajib. Sah? His definition is good. Now it brings us to the second point that we want to talk about that the Sheikh himself, uh, Rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, mentioned, which is example for it. Sheikh mentioned four things. He defined it for you linguistically and technically. The second thing he did for you here is he gave you an example of it. And what was the example he gave? As salawat al khamsa, five daily prayers. So he only gave one example of what? In the chapters of Al Ibadat. He gave you an, a wajib, an oblig- obligatory thing in Ibadat, the chapter of Ibadat. So we'll give you another example of Mu'amalat, which is, for instance, Al Zakat. Zakat is wajib. To be truthful in transaction. Or to fulfill your part in a, in a transaction. Providing for your wife and your children. That's wajib. And it enters mu'amalat. So the second thing that the Sheikh spoke about is example. He gave one example in the chapter of ibadat. I gave you an example of in the chapter of mu'amalat. The third thing that we're going to talk about is atharul wajib. The Sheikh mentioned it. Atharu. Al-wajib. What is the effects? What is the results that come from wajib? The scholars, they look at it from two angles. How many angles do they look at it from? Two angles. The first one is If the person does it to follow Allah Ta'ala's commandment, then he gets rewarded for it. If he's doing it from the angle of a ta'abud, he wants to be a slave and he's worshipping his master, then he's a what? He gets rewarded for it. Like if the person does it, he does it out of mockery, then he's a what? Like the situation of the munafiqeen, is he going to get rewarded for it? Or if a person did it because he was forced to do it, all of these don't get rewarded for it. Are we all together? The person has to do it, he has to do it. He's doing it from the angle of ta'abud, he's worshipping Allah. Point number two, that I thought, no, sorry, the, the second angle that we look at it from is 
أنه يستحق العقاب وتاريخه The one who leaves it off He deserves to be punished He deserves to be punished You see we didn't say He gets punished Because there are people who are going to leave wajib off And Allah is not going to punish them Are we all together? So we say that that person is deserving He deserves to be punished So Allah will punish that person And if He punishes him We believe that is based on who? Adlullahi wa hikmatu it's based on Allah's justice and his fairness and his wisdom. And if he forgives that person, we believe it is because of his what? Afuhu wa rahmatuh. Based on Allah's forgiveness and his mercy. And if Allah punishes a person, we believe it's justice and we believe it is his wisdom of why he did it. Point number four that we're going to go through regarding al-wajib that the author mentioned is the names that the wajib has. Asma'uhu, the names that the wajib has. The author said, Wa yusamma, it is called fardan wa faridatan wa hatman wa laziman. It's called fard. It's called farida. It's called hatm. It's called lazim. The author didn't mention something else which is maktub. Maktub. Kutiba alaykum siyamu. Maktub. All of these are asma' mutaradifa tutlaqu fil istilah wa yuradu biha ma'anan wahidan. All of those words, they mean the same. Fardan wa faridatan wa hatman wa lazima wa maktuban. Like in the Hanafiya, believe fard and wajib are two things. Two separate things. And we mentioned it. Wal mandubu lugatan al mad'u. Wa stilahan ma amara bihi shari'u la ala wajhi al ilzami. Wa stilahan ma amara bihi shari'u la ala wajhi al ilzami. Karrawatibi. فخرج بقولنا ما أمر به الشارع المحرم والمكروه والمباح وخرج بقولنا لا على وجه الإلزام الواجب والمندوب يثاب فاعله امتثالا ولا يعاقب تاركه ويسمى سنة ومسنونا ومستحبا ونفلا مندوب Linguistically means something or someone appointed or designated Technically it means what the legislators ordered but not by way of obligation Re recommended such as superior superrogatory prayers. So what is excluded from our statement, what the legislator has ordered, is whatever is forbidden, disliked and permissible. And what is also excluded from our statement, not by way of obligation, is that which is wajib. So when something is mandub, the doer is rewarded for carrying out the action and not punished for leaving it. It is also called sunnah, masnoon, mustahab and nafal. The author now goes into the second type of al-ahkam al-taklifiyya The second one, the first one was al-wajib And now we're going to go into al-mandub And the author here mentions five things He mentions five things Number one, he defines it He what? He defines it He defines it in the Arabic language And he also defines it in what? He also defines it according to the uh, The usuliyin, the scholars of usul al-fiqh the definition of al-mandub. Let's look at what it is in the Arabic language. It means al-mad'u ilayhi. It is that which is called towards. Okay? Al-mad'u. And the author, rahimahullah, he didn't say al-mad'u ilayhi. He didn't say ilayhi. So he, dis he chose to get rid of the jar and the majroor. And the reason why he did that is minbabi takhfif, as the scholars say, just to make it easy for the people. And the example that it means al madu ilayhi, whatever you call a person to, because mandu means nadb, calling somebody to something, uh, is the example for that is the line of poetry said by Unayf ibn Qurayt al ambari He said, لا يسألون أخاهم حين يندبهم في النائبات على ما قال برحانا. They don't ask their brother, meaning their own tribal member, they don't ask him. When he calls them out to a fight, and he tells them to go to the fight, they don't ask him, they don't say, why are we going to fight with these people? What's the reason? They don't ask him. Whenever he tells them, come let's go fight, they jump in and just fight. They don't know why they're fighting, what they're fighting for. They... Are we all together? They're just loyal to him. So whenever he tells them, do something, they just jump and they do it. But what we want from the line of poetry is 
لا يسألون أخاهم حين يندبهم. That's what we went from it. The word. He said that they don't ask their fellow member, their fellow friend, their fellow brother. They don't ask him. حين يندبهم when he calls them. صح. That's what we want from the word. That's what it means in the Arabic language. You can find it more if you look in the Al Misbah Al Munir and Al Qamus Al Muhit. And if you look at the term Nedb, if you go to Madda to Nedaba, you will find it like that. Especially if you go to the line of poetry which is in Diwan Al Hamasa, you will find the explanation for it. What does it mean according to Istilah Al Usulin? The scholars of Usul Al Fiqh. What's their definition of Al-Mandub? Well, now we know linguistically what it means and in the Arabic language, we now need to learn the technical meaning, the definition according to the Usuliyin. They say, ma amara bihi shari'u, just like we said for the wajib. صح? What was the wajib? The wajib was, ma, all the five enter it, amara bihi shari'u, the legislator commanded it, wajib and mandub, so, so far they're together. لكن لا على وجه الإلزام not in a not in a forceful manner مندوب it's a commandment from Allah عز وجل and Allah requested for the مخلوق the creation to do it but not in a what but not in a forceful manner it's in a recommended manner the second point that the author mentioned here is an example. He gave a example. Um, first, what we have to know is Allah Azza wa Jalla, He has Subhanahu wa Taala, He has made it vast the paths in which we can get reward. The roads and the means to get rewards are vast and they are large in number. And Allah has opened for us many doors of khair, Subhanahu wa Taala. And so because of that, Allah made many things mandub in ibadat and also in mu'amalat, highly recommended that the person comes with them. And from them is like dua ul istiftah, for salah, the dua that you make when you're beginning the prayer, before you read the fatiha, the dua that you make, that's highly recommended. Raf'ul yadayni fi salah, raising your hands up in the salah. Highly recommended. Salat al duha Highly recommended. al ihtisal lil ihram To shower yourself before you put your ihram on is highly recommended. Kitaba to daini wal ishadi alayhi. Writing the debt and also bringing witnesses for it is highly recommended. Also, writing and bringing witnesses for a woman that you want to take back after you divorced her, وَعَلَى الرَّجْعَةِ فِي الطَّلَاقِ It's always recommended. It's not obligatory. Of course, this is a رَجْعَةِ بَيْنُونَ الصغرى. You're taking her back after, maybe one or twice, you've divorced her once. You've divorced her once, and you want to take her back, and the time in which the idda hasn't finished yet, for you to bring people to witness it, it's recommended, you don't have to. Because all you just have to say to your wife is رجعتك. I've taken you back. That's all mandub, highly recommended. The third thing that the Shaykh Rahimahullah spoke about is the outcome and the effects that come out from the mandub. The mandub, mandub just like the wajib, it's looked at from two perspectives. The first one is فاعله, The one who does it he is rewarded ta'abudi. If he does it, imtithalan. If he's trying to get closer to Allah by it, if he's trying to worship Allah in it, subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he is doing it out of servitude, then he gets rewarded like he like the wajib we mentioned. Number two is tarikud. If you leave it off, you don't get punished. Like in Imam Abu Sahak al Shatibi in his Kitab al Muwafaqat, he says something very powerful. He said that leaving of the mandub, you won't get punished. Yes, like in min jihati, min jihati juzi. It only means specific incidents, incidents, specific incidents. If you leave it off, it won't be what. 
it won't be a sin and you won't get punished for it. But he said, if you leave off the mandub, all of them, all of the mandub that there is, you leave it, min haythul kulli, in totality, he said, fa'inu yu'khadu hukm al-wajib. Now it takes the ruling of wajib, you have to do it. So he said, فَالْإِخْلَالُ بِهِ مُطْلَقًا كَالْإِخْلَالِ بِالْوَاجِبِ So pay attention. He's saying that leaving up all of the mandub is like leaving one wajib. Say, they take the same ruling. Shatibi mentions that in his Muwafaqat, the first volume, page 115, and he also mentioned it in his second volume of the Muwafaqat, page 337. The fifth point that we want to learn about the mandub that the author, Rahimahullah, Shaykh Muhammad Salah Uthaymin mentioned is, that the mandub, that the mandub is commanded. That the mandub is a command. Because what did he say at the beginning? Ma amara bihi? Shari'. It is what the shari'. Shari'. Commanded. And this is the madhabu jumhuru usuliyin. This is the belief of the overwhelming majority of usuliyin. And the evidence for that is inna Allah ya'muru bil adli. Al adli here is wajib. Well, ihsani here is the what? The mandub. Inna Allah ya'muru. Allah commanded al-adl, which is wajib. Well, ihsan is the mandub. Are you with me? So the mandub and the wajib are both what? They are commandment from Allah Azza, Azza wa Jalla. Those are the five points that we take from the author, rahimahullah ta'ala. Uh, what he said about the الأحكام التكليفية المندوب. Then the author رحمه الله he said والمحرم لغة الممنوع واصطلاحا ما نهى عنه الشارع على وجه الإلزام بالترك كعقوق الوالدين فخرج بقولنا ما نهى عنه الشارع الواجب والمندوب والمباح وخرج بقولنا على وجه الإلزام بالترك المكروه والمحرم يثاب تاركه امتثالا ويستحق العقاب فاعله وَيُسَمَّ مَحَذُورًا أَوْ مَمْنُوعًا Muharram Linguistically means forbidden and technically it means what was forbidden by the legislator as an obligation to avoid such as disobedience to parents. So what is excluded from our statement forbidden by the legislator is wajib, mandub and mubah permissible. And what is also excluded from our statement an obligation to avoid is that which is disliked. So when something is muharram, forbidden, it means the one who leaves it is rewarded and the one who commits it deserves to be punished. It is also known as mahdur or mamnur. The author here now goes into the third type of lahkam at taklifiyah the third type. We're in the third one, we have two more remaining after this one. And it's al-muharram. The author here mentioned four things. Here, rahimahullah ta'ala. The first thing that he did was he def the definition. He defines it linguistically and he also defined it technically. The linguistic technique, the linguistic, the linguistic usage of the word al-muharram is al-mamnu'. It is, it is al-mamnu'. Prohibited. Allah wa ta'ala said in the ayah, وَحَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِ الْمَرَاضِعَ what does it mean? وَحَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِ الْمَرَاضِعَ in Surah Al-Qasas, Ayah 12. It means مَنَعْنَاهُ مِنْهُنَّ فِي الْقَدَرِ We prevented them from it in the Qadr. And you have to understand, uh, this is talking about uh, the mother of Nabiullah Musa. Allah Taala is saying, we prevented Nabiullah Musa from the breast milk of any other woman. He wasn't taking no other woman's breast milk. He rejected it. So, عليه, Allah used the word Don't think to yourself that this haram here is the haram in the sharia. Because that would mean you're saying that Musa was prohibited from drinking from any other woman. شرعاً. And that can't be possible because he's a sabi, he's a little boy. He's not a mukallaf. Does that make sense? So here Allah is using the linguistic definition which is we stopped him from it, like in, in the Qadr. Universally, he couldn't do it. Nabi Allah Musa couldn't take his mother, another woman's breast milk. He couldn't take it. Allah said, we prevented him. 
This is a mamnu'un fil qadr. It's in the qadr, not in the sharia. Ah. Oh, any other woman can breastfeed a child. Pay attention here. That's what it means in the language. What does it mean in the sharia? Ah? In the sharia, ah, it means ma naha anhu sharia. The word ma again is a jins, right? So all of the five will fall under it. All of the five ahkam taklifi will fall under it. But then he said naha anhu sharia. The legislator prohibited it. The minute he said that the legislator prohibited it, the wajib and the mandub are out of the picture. Because they are not a prohibition, they are a commandment. They're the opposite. Okay? And the mubah is not in the picture. Why is the mubah not in the picture? Because it is not a commandment in doing it. Okay? And it's also not a prohibition. Stay away from it. In a forceful manner, automatically what goes out of the equation is al makruh Because makruh you're prohibited from doing it, but in a recommended manner, not in a forceful manner. Not in a forceful manner. And then the author added a term which is bitarki, in leaving it off. Okay? And he didn't have to say that. Because the fact that he said ma naha, ma naha, that which are prohib- sharia are prohibited from you, that would suffice us. But he added bit turkey for ziyadah to bayani, to clarify it even more for the people. And the reality is, definitions sha'nuha al-ijaz biqadri imkan. Definitions should generally try to be short. Short, they're making it long. So it would have been better if he said, ma naha anhu shari' ala wajhi al-ilzam. Leave it there. And not be tarq. Because what we have at the beginning suffices us from having to mention a tarq. The third thing that the author rahimahullah here mentioned is example. And the example that he gave is uquq al disobedience of the parents, okay, and wrongdoing towards them. Number two, another example would be zina, for example, zina, fornication and adultery. And Namima to be a tail bearer. Killing a person who is not lawful for you to kill them. All of these are things which are muharram and they're prohibited. The effects and the results that come from the muharram. What are the effects and the outcomes? Again, the scholars they look at the muharram min jihataini from two angles. Number one is, in terms of leaving it off. In terms of leaving it off. And that one is categorized into three. In terms of leaving it off, then the scholars, they divide it into three. A group of people who are rewarded for leaving off the haram. They are actually rewarded for leaving the haram. And that is the one who left it off in lillahi. He is doing it to follow Allah's commandment. Or to, he's doing it to stay away from that which Allah prohibited. He's doing it for Allah. And he's doing it because, out of servitude. Then that person will be rewarded. That person will be rewarded. For leaving the evil act. If he, if he did that, for the sake of Allah. As Allah said in the ayah, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَةِ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانَ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْعِسِيَانَ The second type is a group of people يُعَاقَبُ عَلَيْهِ المكلف. The person would actually be punished for leaving it. He left it, but he's still going to get punished. And that is the one who left it for لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ فَأَضْنَ اللَّهِ عز وجل. He left it, but he didn't leave it for Allah's sake subhanahu wa ta'ala. This individual, he's a what? He's going to be punished for it. Why? Because tark is a what? Is a tark a fi'il? Leaving off something, is it an action? It is an action. From an, uh, f- we mentioned that before. The fact that they didn't do anything Allah referred to it as an action. So leaving off something 
for other than Allah is like doing something for other than Allah. And that we call that what? Shirk. And the person is punishable for that. Or another person who left something, okay, he left it after he exerted every effort. He wanted to commit zina with a woman, he called her, he set the time with her, he got the, uh, com- he got the ride and everything ready, and then Qadarullah ma sha'a fa'al, the car broke down. And he wasn't able to get there. And so he just went back home. This individual, he left it, not because he wanted to leave it. He left it because he was unable to do it. That's in terms of looking at it from min jihat tark Now we're going to look at it min jihat al-fi'li from the angle of doing. Okay? And this one is if the person he leaves off the haram, uh, so he does the haram, he deserves to be punished. He deserves to be punished. If somebody does haram, he deserves to be punished. If Allah wants, he, he can punish that person if he wants to, and if he wants, he can forgive them, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the usage of the author here, which is, يستحق العقاب فاعله, that the one who uh, does the muharram, he deserves to be punished, is better than those who say, يعاقب فاعله, the one who does it is punished. It's better what he used. There's an exception here. The exception here is three types of people, if they do the haram, they, are, they don't deserve to be punished. Three types of people, they don't deserve to be punished, even though they did the muharram. And who are they? The one who does it out of ignorance. He doesn't deserve to be punished. The one who does it out of duress. He's been put into a position, life-threatening situation, where he was forced to do the haram. Okay? Or he was about to die, and so he ate pork. He doesn't deserve to be punished. And the third one is a person who did it out of forgetfulness. You're not allowed to eat in Ramadan, right? You're not allowed to eat in Ramadan. Deliberately eating in Ramadan is haram. You deserve to get punished for that. But if he does it because he forgot, he doesn't get punished for it. He doesn't deserve to get punished for it. The fourth point that the author rahimahullah, mentioned here is the names that are given haram. The terms that are given and he mentioned al-mahdhur wal-mamnu wal ma'siyah he didn't mention that was sayyi'ah he didn't mention that was dhamb he didn't mention that the author only mentioned the names that are given mahdhur and mamnu and we added onto what the author rahimahullah said three extra we said al-ma'siyah ma'siyah is a synonym of muharram as sayyi'ah is a synonym of the muharram and al-dhamb al-dhamb is a synonym of Muharram and also Al Makru. The Sharia sometimes uses the word Makru as Haram. As Allah wa Ta'ala after he mentioned a group of things that were Haram, such as killing your own children, you know, committing zina, associating partners with Allah. After Allah mentioned all of that, Allah says, Kullu dhalika kana sayyi'uhu inda rabbika makruhan. All of that to your Lord is makruh. Makruh here doesn't mean the, the definition that we're going to come to soon. The makruh, we're going to come to it now. It doesn't mean that definition usuliyin mentioned. This makruh that's been used in the ayah here is a synonym of muharram. It's a synonym of muharram. And sometimes the term makruh to mean muharram was how the salaf were like. Some of the salaf they would say makru and they meant muharram. And this is, fi al fadi salaf is kathira, it's a lot. Such as, for example, Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, when he said, akrahu salah fil maqabir. Akrahu salah fil maqabir. He used the word akrahu, the prayer in what? In the graveyard. He also, he also even said, akrahu al akl. I. Dislike, if we say according to the mutakhirin of the usuliyin, it would mean I dislike eating in the utensils that are made out of gold and silver. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, لا تأكلوا في آنية الذهب والفضة. Do not eat in utensils made out of gold or silver. And Ahmed saying أكره. It doesn't mean he أكره, meaning dislike. He's saying it's haram. And Ibn al-Qayyim in Alam al-Muqi'in mentioned why the Salaf would use the word akrahu instead of the word 
haram is because min babi tawarru' they sometimes were trying to be on the safe side they didn't want to jump by saying haram to everything because Allah tabarak wa ta'ala he says wala taqulu lima tasifu alsinatukum alkadhiba hadha halal wa hadha haram litaftaru ala Allah alkadhib inna alladhina yaftaruna ala Allah alkadhib la yuflihun it was min babi alwara' because Allah said in the ayah don't say everything that comes to your tongue don't say halal and haram so they didn't want to say it like that that's why they did that. Now we're going to go into the next one that the author mentioned. He said, وَالْمَكْرُوهُ لُغَةً الْمُبْغَضِ المبغض وَالْمَكْرُوهُ لُغَةً الْمُبْغَضِ وَاصْطِلَاحًا مَا نَهَا عَنْهُ الشَّارِعُ لَا عَلَى وَجْهِ الْإِلْزَامِ بِالتَّرْكِ كَالْأَخْذِ بِالشِّمَالِ وَالْإِعْطَاءِ بِهَا فَقَرَجَ بِقَوْلِنَا مَا نَهَا عَنْهُ الشَّارِعُ الْوَاجِبُ وَالْمَنْدُوبُ وَالْمُبَاحُ وخرج بقولنا لا على وجه الإلزام بالترك المحرم والمكروه يثاب تاركه امتثالا ولا يعاقب فاعله مكروه linguistically means something hated and technically it means what was forbidden by the legislator not by way of it being obligated to abandon such as taking and giving with the left hand so what is excluded from our statement forbidden by the legislator is wajib mandub and mubah and what is also excluded from our statement, not by way of obligation, is that which is muharram, forbidden. And when something is makruh, then the one who leaves it out of compliance of the legislator is rewarded, but the one who does the action is not punished. The author, rahimahullah, now goes into the fourth of al-ahkam al taklifi the fourth, which is al-makruh. And the author mentioned three issues regarding it. The author... He mentioned three things regarding it. The first one is its definition. What does al-makruh mean in the Arabic language? It means al-mubghad. What does al-mubghad mean? It's the opposite of al-mahboob, that which is loved. It is that which is disliked. And according to the usage of the usuleen and the technical definition is ma naha anhu sharia. It is whatever the legislator prohibited. Again, when we say the word ma, here it means all five of the ahkam taklifi fall under it. Naha anhu shari' when we say that, what falls under here? Al Muharram and Al Makruh. And what leaves? What leaves is Al Wajibu, Wal Mandubu, Wal Mubah. They're not in the equation. Then when the author said, La ala wajhi al ilzami, what left? The Muharram left. So it is, it is what the legislator prohibited in a recommended manner. It's recommended you to leave it off. It's not saying you have to leave it off, but it said it's better you leave it off. Then the second thing that the author spoke about here is, he gave an example. And the Shari' the legislator, he prohibited some things from us as the creation. Why? Because leaving it is of more beneficial for us. There is benefit in us for leaving it. But it didn't make it hard on us by saying that if you don't leave it, you will get punished for it. Such as, الصلاة, Closing your eyes when you're praying the Salah. Or استقبال القبلة حالة حالة الاستنجاء. Facing the qibla whilst you're doing the istinja. While you're doing the istinja. Istinja here means what? While you're cleaning yourself. Are you with me? You all need to know the difference between istinja and istijmar. Istinja is istinja means to cleanse yourself and to remove from yourself the impurity of whatever came from you but with water with pure water you're cleaning your feces or your urine with water that's called istinja istijmar means using other than water so whichever of those two whilst you're cleaning yourself there's no prohibition that came regarding it the prohibition that came regarding it is whilst you're doing your call of nature so the scholars they say this is makru it's disliked or Shurbu qa'iban, standing and drinking. Ama at tatrib, 
his thawbi qabl al-ihram. A person places perfume on himself when he's at the miqat. He's in Mecca, he's in Dhul Hulayfa, he puts him the atr on himself, and then after that he showers, he puts the atr on himself, and then he does, he places the uh, ihram on himself and he goes. You see, the tib, the perfume goes, it was on his body, and then now where, where did it go on? It went on the clothes, they said it's disliked. All of these examples I'm giving, I may not agree with it. Lakin, don't try to push away the ta'seel because of the tamthil, because of the example I'm giving you. The examples are not necessarily always the correct example, but they are meant to do what? Taqribul fam. It's meant to bring it close to you just to understand what's happening here. وَالْأَخْذُ بِالْيَدِ الشِّمَالِ وَالْإِعْطَاءِ بِهَا Giving with your right hand, sorry, giving with your left hand and taking with your left hand is disliked. Is disliked. So those are examples that the scholars bring and some of the Sheikh mentioned the last one. Sheikh mentioned the last one as an example for the makruh. What about the effects, which is the third, third thing? The effects that come out of the makruh, the results that come out of the makruh. Again, the scholars, they look at it from two angles. The first one is, You will get rewarded for leaving it off. The makruh, if you leave it off, you're doing it imtithalan. You're trying to get closer to Allah by leaving it off, you get rewarded for it, inshaAllah ta'ala. But you will not get punished if you fall, if you fall into it. I mean, if you do it. You will not get punished if you, if you do it. And no, la yu'aqabu ala fi'lihi. Al-Imam Abu Zhaq al-Shatibi, he said, again, as he said about the, as we mentioned for the mandub, for the mandub, Al-Imam Abu Zhaq al-Shatibi said, that you won't get punished for doing it min haythul juz. Maybe one or two or three, sahih. Amma min nahiyatil kul, but all of the makruh, if you're doing it, فَإِنَّهُ يَأْخُذُ حُكْمَ الْمُحَرَّمِ He said it will take the ruling of the haram. It will take the ruling of a haram. And if you look at his kitab, Al-Muwafaqat, again the first volume, page 116, and also page 131, the first volume. He discusses it in great details. So it's good to look at it and what is his examples for that and his evidence for that. The author, rahimahullah, he then says, وَالْمُبَاحُ لُغَةً الْمُعْلَنُ وَالْمَأْذُونُ فِيهِ وَاصْطِلَاحًا مَا لَا يَتَعَلَّقُ بِهِ أَمْرٌ وَلَا نَهْيٌ لِذَاتِهِ كَالْأَكْلِ فِي رَمَضَانَ لَيْلًا فَقَرَجَ بِقَوْلِنَا مَا لَا يَتَعَلَّقُ بِهِ أَمْرٌ الْوَاجِبُ فَقَرَجَ بِقَوْلِنَا مَا لَا يَتَعَلَّقُ بِهِ أَمْرٌ الْوَاجِبُ وَالْمَنْدُوبُ وَخَرَجَ بِقَوْلِنَا وَلَا نَهْيٌ الْمُحَرَّمُ وَالْمَكْرُوهُ وَخَرَجَ بِقَوْلِنَا لِذَاتِهِ ما لو تعلق به أمر لكونه وسيلة لمأمور به أو نهي لكونه وسيلة لمنهي عنه فإن له حكم ما كان وسيلة وسيلة له من مأمور أو منهي ولا يخرجه ذلك عن كونه مباحا في الأصل والمباح ما دام على وصف الإباحة فإنه لا يترتب عليه ثواب ولا عقاب ويسمى حلالا وجائزا Mubah linguistically means something declared or permitted to do and technically it means what is not connected with a command or not something prohibited in and of itself like eating during the nights of Ramadan. So what is excluded from our statement what is not connected with a command is that which is wajib and mandub recommended. And what is also excluded from our statement not something prohibited is whatever is muharram, forbidden and makruh, disliked. And what is not included by, by the saying in and of itself is anything which is connected to a command therefore being a medium which would then itself be commanded. Or something forbidden would also act as a medium to something which would also be forbidden and that would not take it out of the original state of mubah, permissible. And something is mubah, permissible, as long as the description is one of permissibility then it will not result in reward or punishment and is also called halal and jaiz. The author, rahimahullah, he now goes into the last and final type of al-ahkam al-taklifiya, the fifth type. And he mentions four, he mentioned four things here. 
he mentioned four things. The first thing is, Ta'rifu, he defined what uh, Al-Mubah is in the Arabic language. And he mentioned that the Mubah in the Arabic language, يطلق على معنيين, it is referred to in two things. The first meaning is Al-Mu'lan. It is to announce something and to proclaim something. And that's like the statement of Zamakhshari, the great Mu'tazili. Zamakhshari, the Mu'tazili. He said, uh, He said, If they ask me about my madhab, لم أبوح به, I will not proclaim it. I will not announce it. لم أبوح به, he said. I will not announce it and I will not make it public. وأكتمه, and I will conceal it. And then he said, كتمانه لي أسلم. Concealing it and hiding it is more safer for me. فإن حنفيا قلت قال بأنني أبيح الطلاء وهو شراب محرم. If I say I'm a Hanafi, then they would say I permit the tila, and the tila is a uh, it's a substance that is prohibited to drink. وإن مالكيا قلت if I say I'm a Maliki, قالوا بي, they say بأنني أبيح لهم that I permit for them. Lahmul kilabi, the flesh of the dog, wahum humu, and the dog's flesh is what it really is. I mean, the eating of the uh, dog, uh, it is uh, the ruling is known. Wa in shafi'iyan qul tu qalu bi anni ubi hunika hal binti wal bintu tahrumu. And if I say I am a shafi'i, then they say that you permit the marrying of the daughter, and marrying the daughter is impermissible. وَإِنْ حَنْبَلِيٌّ قُلْتُ قَالُوا بِأَنَّنِي If I say I'm a Hanbali, they would say ثَقِيلٌ حَلُولِيٌّ بَغِيضٌ مُجَسِّمٌ They would say I'm an, um, uh, a person who is full of hate and enmity. I'm a Haluli who says Allah and the creation. In other words, I believe in pantheism and etc. And that I'm a Mujassim. I'm, I'm a person who gives Allah a uh, a physical uh, body. They will say that all about me. وَإِنْ قُلْتُ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْحَدِيثِ وَحِزْبِهِ If I say I'm from Ahlul Hadith, I'm, I'm from the people of Hadith now, يَقُولُ They will say to me, تَيْسٌ لَيْسَ يَدْرِي وَيَفْهَمُ He's one person who doesn't know anything, has no knowledge. تَعَجَّبْتُ مِنْ هَذَا الزَّمَانِ وَأَهْلِهِ He said, I'm fascinated with this time and its people. فَمَا أَحَدٌ مِنْ أَلْسُنِ النَّاسِ يَسْلَمُ there's no person who can be safe from the people's tongues. So if when it came to the other madhabs, he just mentioned a fiqh issue. When it came to Imam Muhammad, he mentioned a aqidah issue. Because he's, he is a, he is a uh, filthy mu'tazili. But the thing that concerns us here is, وَإِنْ يَسْأَلُوا عَنْ مَذْهَبِي If they ask me about my madhab, لَمْ أَبُوحْ بِهِ I will not pronounce it, and I will not announce it. وَأَكْتُمُهُ I will conceal it. And then he said, كِتْمَانُهُ لِيَ أَسْلَمُ and to conceal it is better for me. So that's the first meaning, al-mu'lanu, that which is announced and made public. The second meaning is al fihi, that which is permitted and allowed. And the second meaning, al fihi, that which you're permitted to do, permission is given. And that's the second meaning, which the shar'i, the usuliyin, the definition that they are taking, they're basing it on that meaning, which is al fihi, that which you have been given uh, the rights and you've been permitted. What does it mean according to the definition of the usuliyin? It means مَا لَا يَتَعَلَّقُ بِهِ أَمْرٌ وَلَا نَهْيٌ لِذَاتِهِ مَا لَا يَتَعَلَّقُ بِهِ أَمْرٌ No command is connected to it. وَلَا نَهْيٌ And there's no prohibition connected to it لِذَاتِهِ in and within itself. There are three sentences that are connected to the technical definition of Al-Mubah. Three sentences. Three points are connected to the technical definition of Al-Mubah. The first thing is مَا لَا يَتَعَلَّقُ بِأَمْرٌ It's, there's no command connected to it. So it's not wajib and it's not mandub. The second is وَلَا نَهْيٌ And there's no prohibition connected to it. So it is not muharram or makruh. لِذَاتِهِ in and within itself. Here's something that you have to understand, which is 
the mubah in and within itself, the command and the prohibition is not connected to it. But what can happen is, it could happen, the mubah, which there is a command and a prohibition external from it. Not in and within itself, but external from it. لِأَمْرٍ خَارِجِيٍ Something external is connected to a command and a prohibition. And so it becomes, the mubah is now a means. So it becomes commanded for you to either do it, or you become prohibited from, do it, from doing it. I'll give you an example. Eating in and within itself is mubah. In and within itself is mubah. Um, but let's say if the person is about to die, and they're going to die due to hunger, then it becomes wajib for that person to eat because it's going to lead to something haram. So the mubah now changes from its original ruling. For example, buying is mubah in its essence. A shira is mubah in its essence is, is permissible. You're allowed to do it. You don't have to. No one's commanding you to do it and no one's prohibiting you from doing it. Lakin it becomes recommended. Okay? It becomes recommended if it's a form of beautification for for Jum'ah. For example, the person has clothes but they're not as beautiful as this new clothes here. He's got the money for it. It is recommended here for him to go out and what? Buy that clothes. Because beautify yourself and looking good on Jum'ah is highly recommended. Also, eating from the food of Zayd, for example, from the people. Zayd from the people. You know, Zayd. Or Bakr, or Amr, Khalid. Eating his uh, uh, wealth and using it, it's mubah in its essence. But, there's a high speculation that his wealth has come from haram. And in this situation, it's makuruh. You're not sure it's haram, there's a high speculation. It's disliked for you to use it. So these are the, the ihtiraz that come out of the word lidatihi. So what does mubah mean? مَا لَا يَتَعَلَّقُ بِي أَمْرٌ There's no command in, in mubah. وَلَا نَهِي There's no prohibition in mubah. Lidati in and within itself. Okay? Second point that the author rahimahullah mentioned here is an example. He gave an example for it. وَلِذَلِكَ The scholars they mention, like Ibn Ashur in his kitab Maqasid al-Shari'a al-Islamiyya, he mentioned that the mubah is the most ahkam at taklifiyatul khamsa. From the five, the one that occurs the most is the mubah. And that is مِن رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى بِعِبَادِهِ وَتَيْسِيرِهِ لَهُ and that is an indication of Allah's mercy to his creation and that Allah wants to make matters easy for his creation. An example of mubah is al-aklu fi Ramadan layla. Eating the night of Ramadan, it's mubah. Um, enjoying your wife is mubah after they purify themselves from their menstruation, to have a intimate relationship is mubah. Eating fruit and enjoying yourself by eating fruit is also mubah. All of these are mubah. Number, point number three that the author rahimahullah mentioned is the effects that the mubah has, the outcome of mubah. Mubah is looked at from two angles, from two perspectives. Number one is that the mubah remains in its original form. Okay, if it remains in its original form, فَلَا يَتَرَتَّبُ عَلَيْهِ ثَوَابٌ وَلَا عِقَابٌ Then no reward is connected to it, nor any prohibition. You're not going to be rewarded for doing it, and you're not going to be, prohibit, you're not going to be punished for leaving it. That's if it's left in its original essence. But if it's a means to a command, or a means to a prohibition, then the ruling changes. Okay? The second thing is 
that the mubah leaves its original form. The mubah can leave its original form and it can become wajib. And it can also even become mandub. And it can also even become makruh. Or it can even become muharram. It takes the ruling of the other ones, the other remaining four. It can take each and every one of them. Lakin, it's min babil wasila in terms of means. Not in and within itself. And I gave an example for each and every one of them. I gave an example for it being wajib. And I said it's like eating um, in its original essence. But if you're fearful that you're going to die, then it's obligatory for you to eat. I gave the example of mandub. Buying uh, in its original essence is a mubah. But if it's a means to beautify yourself for Jum'ah, then it becomes recommended. I also mentioned eating min mali zayd, eating from the wealth of zayd, is mubah in its original essence. But it becomes makruh, disliked if it's malu zayd, the wealth of zayd, there's a high speculation that it's what? al kasbul haram, haram income. And I gave the example of haram, which is bay'ul anab, bay'ul inab, selling grapes in its original essence is permissible, but it is haram if you're selling it to a person who's going to make khamar out of it and you're sure. So the mu'ibaha, it became wajib in one situation, it became mandub in one situation, and it became makru in another situation, and it also became muharram in another situation. All based on what? It being a means to these things. The fourth point that the Shaykh rahimahullah mentioned is that the mubah, it's called halal. The mubah, a synonym for it is halal. And that is the evidence Allah Taala says, أُحِلَّ لَكُمْ لَيْلَ تَصْيَامِ الرَّفَثُ إِلَى نِسَائِكُمْ it has been made for you to have intimacy with your wives at night in Ramadan. So, uhilla lakum halal. Also, jaiz. Jaiz is a synonym. And the Sheikh mentioned those two. Jaiz. But what the Sheikh didn't mention is tilqan. Tilqan. And the reason why tilqan is also a synonym of mubah is because tilqan means. The Sharia unrestrictedly gave the slave choice in this issue. Whether he wants he can do it or whether he wants he can leave it. Tilqan. Now we have finished Walillahi alhamdu wal minna al ahkam al taklifiyya. We've spoken about the five. Now we're going to start the second type of al ahkam al shar'iyya, which is called al ahkam al wadiyya. The second type of what? Al-Ahkam al sharia which is called Al-Ahkam al wadiyya The author, rahimahullah, he says, Al-Ahkam al wadiyya Ma wada'ahu al-shari'u min amaratin li thubootin aw intifa'in aw nufoothin aw ilgha'in wa minha al- wa minha al-sihhatu wal-fasad Rulings of wadiyya The rulings of wadiyya are that which the, the or that which the legislator has placed signs for to prove its validity or absence of or implementation or cancellation and from which is valid uh, sahih or invalid fasid now the author rahimahullah goes into al-ahkam al-wad'iyah al-ahkam al-wad'iyah the author says the following he says ma wada'ahu al-shari' min amarat the legislator allah azza wa jalla he placed signs and when those signs are there, then lithubutin, something has become present. Something has now been taken into consideration. Lithubutin. Aw intifa. Aw nufudin aw ilga. The word intifa is used for babul ibadat. And nufud and ilga is used for babul mu'amalat. Pay attention to that. The word intifa, it is used. When something is accepted in Babu al-Ibadat, okay? Thubut and Intifa' are both used for Babu al-Ibadat. Nufud and Ilgha is used for Babu al-Mu'amalat. And they all be, mean the same, but just in different 
chapters that are used for. So in the chapter of Ibadat, you say Thubut and Intifa. And in the chapters of Mu'amalat, you say Nufud or Ilga. Here, what you have to understand is the Shaykh Rahimahullah he said something which is Ma Wada'ahu Shari'u. He used the word Ma Wada'ahu. And here, the, it wasn't good that he used the word Wada'ahu. Because it, the, the scholars that speak about Sana'atul Hudud, definitions and how definitions are done, those who call themselves Ulama al Mantiq, who talk about Tasdiq and um, Tasdiq. Uh, and they talk about hudud and definitions, they mention that you can't bring the term you're defining in the word that you're defining it, it, it in. We're talking about wadhiyah and then you say ma wadahu. And they call this a dawr. A dawr. Which means that you're going to go in circles. Al Kafuwi speaks about this in his kitab al Kulliyat. You're going to go back in circles. Because you're defining a word, but you're using the same term inside the definition which makes it hard to be understood what you're trying to say so you can't define something with something again the same thing it's called door you're going to go in circles and the door the definition that kafwi gave is so al-ahkam al-wad'iyya is ma wada'ahu shari'u the Sharia has placed this as a sign. It's a sign that this thing is established or it's what? It's established or it's not established in Ibadat. Or it's considered in Mu'amalat or it's dismissed and cancelled in Ibadat. And guess what? It's called as sihhat wal Fasad. If it meets the criteria and the conditions, it's called Sahih. And if the criteria and the conditions are missing, it's called Fasid. In simple terms, in simple terms, it's like this. That the ahkam al is as though the legislator is saying to you, if you find this alama, if you find this sign, and you find this, remember that my ruling in this issue is this, this, this. That's all it is. The difference now between al ahkam al and al ahkam al is Ahkam al taklifiyya you need to come with it. And you need to exert the effort of coming with it. Like in Ahkam al wadiyya there's no burden on you to come with it. That's not your role. It is something that will come naturally. Allah will bring it about, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You just have to wait for its occurrence. And once it does, then you have to do what you're told to do. For example, Zawal al-Shams. The sun to reach the zenith for Dhuhr to come in, okay, or to pass the meridian for the Dhuhr to become obligatory. That's not upon you to do that, okay, and you're not requested to come with that. You're also not to, you're also not requested to come with puberty. I was going to say to you, you come with puberty and make yourself become. A reach age of puberty. That's no one would say that to you because that's that hukum wadi. For instance, the wealth your mal reaching the nisab, the amount in which you have to pay the zakat from it, it is not upon you to bring it. It is not permissible for you to bring it. Like in the ahkam al taklifi, it's in the ability of the mukallaf. You're able to come with it. You're able to bring it. Um, the ahkam al wadiyya are actually five, but the author only mentioned two of them, and the rest he mentioned it inside. He mentioned it inside there, we will pick it all out. And they are al sihat wal fasad. The author mentioned those two. But there are other three that are missing, which is al sababiyya, and al shartiyya, and al mani'iyya. Al sabab, al shart, and al mani'i. We'll speak about that inshallah ta'ala, what they all mean. نعم. The author then says فالصحيح لغة السليم من المرض واصطلاحا ما ترتبت آثار فعلي عليه عبادة كان أم عقدا 
فالصحيح من العبادات ما برئت به الذمة وسقط به الطلب والصحيح من العقود ما ترتبت آثاره على وجوده كترتب الملك على عقد البيع مثلا ولا يكون الشيء صحيحا إلا بتمام شروط وانتفاء موانعه مثال ذلك في العبادات أن يأتي بالصلاة في وقتها تامة تامة شروط تامة تامة شروطها وأركانها وواجباتها مثال ذلك في العبادات أن يأتي بالصلاة في وقتها تامة شروطها وأركانها وواجباتها ومثال ذلك في العقود أن يعقد بيعا تامة شروطه المعروفة مع انتفاء موانعه فإن فقد شرط من الشروط أو وجد مانع من الموانع امتنعت الصحة مثال فقد الشرط في العبادة أن يصلي بلا طهارة ومثال فقد الشرط في العقد أن يبيع ما لا يملك ومثال وجود المانع في العبادة أن يتطوع بنفل مطلق في وقت النهي ومثال وجود المانع في العقد أن يبيع من تلزمه الجمعة شيئا بعد بعد ندائها الثاني على وجه لا يباح نعم صحيح Linguistically means something free of disease and technically it means the effects resulting from an act of worship or a contract so sahih valid acts of worship are acts that fulfill the responsibility by meeting the requirements and what is sahih valid regarding contracts is that the effects of it are directly affected by its existence such as a relationship between property and the contract of sale for example so nothing can be valid until it meets the necessary conditions and it's free of any obstacles preventing it from being valid for example, part of worship is to perform the prayer on time, fulfilling all the conditions, pillars and obligatory steps. An example of contracts is to have a contract of sale, fulfilling all the known conditions without anything, anything that would stop it being a valid contract. So if one of these conditions is not present or an impediment is present, it prevents it from being valid. An example of that is the condition of worship. To pray without purification, an example of that in contracts is the absence of a requirement in the contract such as selling that which one does not have an example of the presence of an impediment in worship is to op offer a supererogatory prayers at a time of prohibition and an example of the presence of an impediment in contracts is to sell something during friday prayer after the second call in a way that is not permissible the author, rahimahullah, he speaks about as-sahih and he mentions three issues regarding it. Three issues we spend, uh, we, we go through. Three things, inshallah ta'ala, the author mentions here. The first thing is, ta'rifu is definition. He defines what sahih means. And he defines it linguistically and technically. He says that the sahih, lughatan in the Arabic language is, as-salimu min al-marad. That which is free from illness. Allah has, subhanahu wa ta'ala has freed it from illness. And the plural of sahih is sihah. وَلِذَلِكَ يُسَيْءَ أَحَادِيثٌ صِحَاحٌ وَدَرَاهِمُ صِحَاحٌ لكن the sahih, the sahih, which is مِنْ بَدَنِ الْإِنسَانِ from the human body, فَيُجْمَعُ عَلَىٰ أَصِحَاحٌ when it comes to the human body, the plural is not sihah, it is what? Asihah. Wasahah lugatan fi sahih. And the word asahah, bi fathi sadina, it's a language in the Arabic language. You can find that more, inshallah ta'ala, if you go to Al Misbah al Munir and if you go to Al Qamus al Muhit. What does it mean in the technical meaning? What do the usuliyin mean by it? They mean ma taratabat aatharu fi'lihi alihi ibadatan kanat. Um, in simple terms, simple terms, ما ترتبت آثاره عليه شرعا. It is any speech or actions in which the shari, the shari goal was reached. Then this is considered sahih. And the reason why we say the shari goal was reached. And the effects of what the Sharia wanted was found is because 
a person may pray, for example, and it may be sahih from what it seems to what? Hissan, tangibly. When you look at it, it's okay, sahih. Like it, according to the Sharia, it is not sahih. So, usuliyin, when, it, when they say sahih, they're not looking at it. Atharu alayhi hissan. The observation that you see. But when the Prophet said to the man, Irja' fa salli fa innaka lam tusalli. Go back and pray, you haven't prayed. The man, hissan, he prayed. But he didn't pray shara'an. He didn't pray shara'an because it's not sahih what he did. So we don't call that sahih. Then the author mentioned that the sahih enters two chapters. He said, ibadatan, it enters the chapters of ibadat and it also enters what? Aqd. But what would have been better is that the author didn't use the word aqd. The reason why, shahadat, sahih falls under it. Shahada can be uh, fasid and it can be sahih. And shahada is not an aqd, it's not a contract or transaction. So if you use the word mu'amala, it would have encompassed everything. It would have encompassed what? It would have encompassed al-fusuq and al-shahadat, all of it. So it would have been better if he said ibadatan kana am mu'amalatan. Or even if he said adatan. It would have been good as well. I now want to mention as a side point before we move on to the second point, which is what is the difference between sahih and mujzi? If we say that this salah is sahih, I mean this salah is mujzi. Okay, what is the difference? The difference is that sahih it encompasses ibadat and the mu'amalat. Sahih is used for ibadat and it's also used to form the mu'amalat. Whereas mujzi yakhtasu bil ibadat, it's specific to ibadat. So for example, you say salah sahiha. Or you can say salah mujzi'ah. You can also say bay' sahih, but you can't say bay' mujzi. You can't say that because bay' is a mu'amala and the term mujzi is not used. And mujzi and sahih are synonyms, meaning they are used together. I mean, they mean the same, but the usage here is different. The, th uh, the, second, sorry, the second point that the author mentioned here is the athar, the outcome and the effects that come from uh, as sahih. Um, what comes from it is two things, okay? We have to look at it in, the, in terms of these two. The first one is the effects that are connected to the ibadat. They're connected to what? Ibadat. If it's connected to the ibadat, then the effect is bara'atu dhimma. Bara'atu dhimma. You're free and wasuqutu talab. And the request is no longer placed your way. The charges are dropped. Ama, the request is dropped. No one's going to demand anything from you. So the wajib is not obligatory on you and the request is no longer applying on you. That's what it means. If you hear that this ibadah sahiha, it means bara'atu dhimma wa suqutu talab. No longer. This person is free to go. Number two is athar muta'aliqatu bil mu'amalat. What about when it enters mu'amalat? The effect that it has and the outcomes that it has, it is that ترتب آثارها المقصودة منها على وجودها. For example, transaction is the intent that was needed is met. In transaction, what it means is that the objective has been reached. For instance, the bay, the transaction, the selling and the buying, which is صحيح, it is ownership has gone into one person's hand. That means this person wanted this product and he now owns it. It's his, it's going to be given to him. Take this. And this person wanted the money, he got the money. This now we say, The intent that was needed was reached. It's reached. Why? This person owns the product and this man has his money and both parties are happy. 
What about rent? Well, ijaratu sahiha. The rent that sahih is that ma taratab alayha milkul manfa'a. It's now this person now owns the benefits. He can benefit from this place. He could use this place. What about nikah which is sahih? Nikah which is sahih is ma taratab alayha jawazul intifa'i bil bud'a. Now this mini onwards, this man is permitted and he is allowed to have sexual intercourse with this woman. He is permitted for it. The last point that the author rahimahullah mentioned is the last thing that the Shaykh rahimahullah mentioned is Mata Yakunu Shayu Sahiha. When does something become Sahih? This is the important question. When does it become Sahih in Ibadat and Muamalat? When does it become Sahih? If two things are present. If two things are present, then then it is then it's sahih in ibadat and mu'amalat so you can now say this nikah is sahih you can say this salah is sahih you can say any ibadat and any mu'amalat you can refer to it sahih when two things are present number one tamam jami' shuruutihi all of the complete conditions are present if all of the conditions are missing, or some of the conditions are missing, lam yasih. It's not sahih. And what's the definition of a shart? Ma yalzamu min adam il adam, wa la yalzamu min wujudihi il wujud. Wa la adam li dhatihi. For instance, Salah which is sahiha hiya leti wujida jabi'u shurutiha min al tahara. For example, the salah which is sahih is the salah all of the conditions have been found. All of the prerequisites are there. For instance, purification, covering your private part, facing the qibla, the entering of the prayer time. All of these are what? They are the conditions of the salah. All of them are met. For example, the hajj which is sahih is the hajj which is conditions have been found in it. Such as al Islam, wal Aql. The person is a Muslim, and there's also sanity there. He's sane, he's not an insane person, but he's a sane person. For example, the transactions that is considered sahih is that the con seven conditions of transaction are present. For instance, at Tarabi, both parties are happy with one another. Wal Qudratu al Taslim, and the other person has the ability to surrender the product to the person. And this وَإِبَاحَةُ دَفْعِ الْمَبِيعِ مِنْ غَيْرِ حَاجَةِ And etc. All of the other conditions that are needed. The nikah which is sahih is the nikah which the conditions are present. For example, تَعِيلِ الزَّوْجَيْنِ The two people who want to get married are known. And they are both pleased with one another. And the wali is there. And he's given the permission. And the witnesses are there. That is called a nikah, which is sahih. The conditions are there. If a condition is missing, then we will say, lam yasih. This is not sahih. For example, salah without tahara, that salah is not sahih. Zakat, without reaching age of puberty. Sorry, sorry zakat, without the money reaching, sorry, the nisab, it is not sahih. Fasting, Bef Ramadan before the time enters is غير sahih. Selling what you don't own is غير sahih. And other than that, number two, the second thing that needs to be found. The first one is that all oh, the conditions are present, right? The second one is intifa ujami'i mawani'i. All of the preventing Preventing factors are absent and uplifted. If there is a preventing factor there, then it's nothing. It's null and void. It is what? Null and void. For example, praying voluntary, I'm a supererogatory prayers that doesn't have a purpose. This supererogatory prayer that you're going to pray, this tatawu' that you're going to pray, it has no reason. And you're going to pray it at what? At the time when the salah is prohibited, then the salah is ghayru sahiha. It's not sahih. 
Because why? There is a preventive factor there, which is you're not allowed to pray this time. You're prohibited from praying this time. Or giving zakat to a rich person is also incorrect. Why? Because there is a preventive factor there, which is you're giving to a rich person and that is incorrect. You're not allowed to. You have to give it to a poor person. Or for example, a woman who's on her menses, she fasts, then it's also incorrect. Why? There is a preventive factor here, which is al haydu the menstruation. Selling after the second adhan went off and the imam has climbed the pulpit on a Friday, you're selling, then this is غير صحيحة. It's null and void. Why? Because you're doing it after the prohibited time. So there's a preventive factor. So any act, there has to be وجود شروطه وانتفاء موانعه. The conditions have to be all present and the preventive factors have to be uplifted and gone. Then we call it صحيح. Then we call it, then we call it صحيح. Then the author, rahimahullah, he says, والفاسد لغة الذاهب ضياعا وخسرا واصطلاحا ما لا تترتب آثار فعله عليه عبادة كان أم عقدا فالفاسد من العبادات ما لا تبرع به الذمة ولا يسقط به الطلب كالصلاة قبل وقتها والفاسد من العقود ما لا تترتب آثاره عليه كبيع المجهول وكل فاسد من العبادات والعقود والشروط فإنه محرم فإنه محرم لأن ذلك من تعدي حدود الله واتخاذ آياته هزوا ولأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنكر على من اشترطوا شروطا ليست في كتاب الله والفاسد والباطل ببعد واحد إلا في موضعين الأول في الإحرام ففر الأول في الإحرام فرقوا بينهما بأن الفاسد ما وطئ فيه المحرم قبل التحلل الأول والباطل مرتد فيه عن الإسلام الثاني في النكاح فرقوا بينهما بأن الفاسد ما اختلف العلماء في فساده كالنكاح بلا ولي والباطل ما أجمع على بطلانه كالنكاح المعتدة فاسد Linguistically means something that has been lost or is at loss and technically it means the effects that do not result from an act of worship or a contract Therefore, the fasid in valid acts of worship are those that do not fulfill the obligation so the demand is not met, such as praying before the correct time. And fasid in valid contracts are those that have no effect, such as selling something unknown. All corrupt, all corrupt acts of worship, contracts and conditions are haram, forbidden, because that is transgressing the limits of Allah and taking his verses as a mockery because the Prophet وسلم, forbade stipulating conditions that are not in the Book of Allah. Fasid, invalid, and batil, false, have the same meaning except in two instances. Number one, in ihram. Fasid is what the person in ihram treads on while in ihram before the first constraints of ihram are lifted. And batil, falsehood, is if he denounces Islam whilst doing it. Number two, in marriage. Fasid is whatever the scholars differed in as being corrupt or not, such as marriage without a guardian, and batil is what has been unanimous, unanimously agreed upon, such as the false nature of marriage of a widow or a divorced woman in her waiting period. The author here now goes into al fasid, and fasid is the opposite of al sahih, and it's the second point regarding uh, al hakam al wadiya. We're now going to go over four points regarding al fasid. The first one is the definition of it in the Arabic language and the technical definition. In the Arabic language, the author says ضَيَاعًا وَخُسْرًا In the Arabic language, it means الذَّاهِلُ ضَيَاعًا وَخُسْرًا It is whatever is lost. That's what fasid means. Whatever is lost and it's, it's not in possession anymore. اصطلاحًا <laughs> According to the definition of the Usuliyin, it is ما لا يترتب آثاره عليه شرعا. The Shari goal has not been reached. 
We haven't attained the effects which the Sharia wanted from it. It's not, it's not met. The demand of the Sharia hasn't been met. <coughs> so every speech and every action in which the Shari effects have not been met, it hasn't. The effects of the Sharia that was meant to be there is not there. It's considered fasid. Whether it's a ibadah or whether it's a mu'amala. The Shaykh again he says, ibadatan kana am aqda. He uses the word aqd again. And what is best to use is mu'amala. So, anyways, the Shaykh rahimahullah ta'ala is telling us that the fasad can also enter what? Ibadah and mu'amala. And the fact that the author rahimahullah he keeps saying um, shar'an, shar'an, it shows the benefit that. Um, or we said it here uh, the author didn't it's important that we bring the term shara'an in there because a person can physically be doing something it will be fasted in the sharia even though he's physically doing it but because the shara'i goal has not been reached the second thing that we want to stand, stand over is atharul fasid what are the outcomes and the effects that are taken from the fasid what we take from it is that the fasid, its presence is like its absence. Wujuduhu ka'adami. Whether it's a ibadah or whether it's a mu'amala. Its presence and its absence is the same. So in ibadat, we mentioned before, la tabra'u bihi dhimma. Your, your neck is not free from it. It's still on your neck. وَلَا يَسْقُطُ بِهِ الطَّلَبْ And the request is still on you. For example, praying a salah before its timing or praying it before or praying without purification. You pray the salah before its timing. Or you pray it without any tahara. You're going to... لَا تَبْرَعْ بِهِ ذِمَّةً It's not lifted from your neck. And the request is still there. The request is still there. Or um, fasting the missed day of Ramadan, you fast on an Eid day. You choose to fast your Ramadan that you missed on an Eid day. لا تبرع به ذمة. It won't be lifted from your shoulders. And the request will not be uplifted from you. You're still going to be demanded to come with it. And the evidence for that is the Hadith al Musi'u Salatahu. The one who prayed the prayer and he was getting it wrong every time the Prophet was sending him back. Why? Because he was missing the condition of al-tuma'nina. He was not tranquil. And so that showed that it was fasidah. The Prophet was considering it like he didn't do it. He was saying to him, irja' fasalli fa inna kalam tusalli. Go back and pray. You're not praying. Also the same when it comes to mu'amalat. Like you're selling something that is unknown. Or you're trading in riba. Or you're selling rahnu ma la bay'u. Something which is marhoon. Your look, somebody gave you something, somebody took debt from you and they gave you their phone for instance. They said to you, hold on to my phone until I bring back your, lo your loan, the loan. And so what you do is, you, before they can bring back the loan, you sell the rahn. You're not allowed to. All of those are what? Fasidul i'tibar. It's given no consideration. The third thing that the Shaykh Rahimahullah mentioned here is the action of al fasid. What about the person who does fasid? It's haram to initiate and start an act of fasad. Yahrumu fi'l al fasid ibtida'an. To initiate and to start in the beginning is haram. For example, somebody passed wind. It is not permissible for him to continue praying until he purifies himself. He's not allowed to start the prayer without a purification. And if it happens to him in the prayer, he's not allowed to carry on. He has to stop. Both times. So he's not allowed to start it. Something he knows which is fasid, And he's not allowed to carry on if it happens to him whilst in it. Both times it is not allowed. 
and you're not allowed to initially enter into a transaction which is ribawi. I'm a ribawi. You know it's a riba based transaction. You're not allowed to enter it. And if it became clear to you that it was riba after you got into it, you're not allowed to carry on, you should stop it. The Shaykh Rahimahullah, he mentioned that all of the fasid in ibadat and in uqud, they are all haram. And he also said three things that they are. They are, he said, ta'addi hudud Allah. Ta'addi hudud Allah. You're exceeding Allah's boundaries. And he's referring to the 14th ayah in Surah An-Nisa, where Allah says, وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيَتَعَدَّ حُدُودَهُ يُدْخِلْهُ نَارًا خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ مُهِينٌ The second thing that the author, رحمه الله, mentioned is, وَاتِّخَاذُ آيَاتِي هُزْوًا You are mocking Allah تبارك وتعالى's verses. And he's referring to the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah 231, where Allah says, وَلَا تَتَّخِذُوا آيَاتِ اللَّهِ هُزْوًا And also the Shaykh, رحمه الله, he says it is also that which the messenger rejected, which is عَلَى مَنْ اشْتَرَطُوا شُرُوطًا لَيْسَتْ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ Those who took a condition that were not present in the book of Allah, meaning opposed the condition, the condition opposed the book of Allah. And he's referring to the hadith that's found in Bukhari and Muslim. That the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَا بَالُوا أَقْوَامٍ مِنْ يَشْتَرِطُونَ شُرُوطًا لَيْسَتْ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ مَا كَانَ مِنْ شَرْطٍ لَيْسَ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ بَاطِلٍ وَإِنْ كَانَ مِئَةَ شَرْطٍ The Prophet said, what is the situation of a people who are placing conditions that are not found in the book of Allah? Any condition that is not in the book of Allah, it is بَاطِلٍ وَإِنْ كَانَ مِئَةَ شَرْطٍ وَإِنْ كَانَ even if it's a hundred conditions. The fourth point that the author rahimahullah mentions is the relationship between al-fasid and al-batil are they synonyms are they different fasid and batil are synonyms they are the same bima'nan wahid according to the overwhelming majority of usuriyin but they only differ them from one another في مواضع يسيرة in little situations and contexts they say that they're both not the same the fasid and the batil are not the same and the shaykh رحمه الله he mentioned two of them he only mentioned two of them but there are more that are mentioned the first one is في الإحرام بالحج in hajj he says حيث فرقوا بينهما بأن الإحرام فاسد so for example a man he had sexual intercourse Okay, a person done hajj, he's in hajj, he had sexual intercourse, when lacking? قبل التحلل الأول, before the تحلل الأول, he had sexual intercourse with his wife. This one is fasid. And batil is if he apostates from Islam whilst he's in a state of ihram. وَالْعِيَادُ بِاللَّهِ Okay, also the... Aqdun nikah, the contract of marriage. Two individuals are married or marrying one another. The Shaykh Rahimahullah, he says, they distinguish between al-fasid and al-batil. What is fasid here and what is batil? Fasid is whatever the fuqaha differed on, on it. Like an nikah bila wali or bila shuhud. Marrying a woman without her guardian or without witnesses. This one they call it fasid. Or marrying a majusiya, a fire worshipper. Or marrying a woman that you did zina with. And the batil is that which the fuqaha unanimously agreed upon, such as marrying a woman who's on her idda, a woman who's, who's in her idda. She's in her idda, she didn't leave it. Okay? Or a woman, her husband died and she's still within the period of time. You marry her while she's in the time. Or marrying your mother or your sister. Or marrying a, uh, uh, two sisters together in marriage. All of these, they call it batil. They call it all of this batil. 
That's the difference that the author rahimahullah says is between al-fasid wal batil. And alhamdulillah, we have finished the chapter al-ahkam. And we spoke about the two points that the author rahimahullah brought, which is the definition of al-ahkam and the types of rulings in the sharia. We've defined al-ahkam linguistically and technically. We've also talked about the types of rulings in the sharia, the ahkam al shariya the two types that they are, al-ahkam, al-taklifiyya, and we spoke about the five that came out of it in details, and then we spoke about al-ahkam al wadiya and we spoke about the two that came out of it. And inshallah ta'ala, next lesson we will be speaking about, bi-idhnillahi al-kareem, we will speak about al-ilm, knowledge, perception and knowledge. The author, rahimahullah, is going to talk about that. The reason he will and why he brought that chapter, we'll speak about it next lesson, inshallah ta'ala. Anything which I have said that was incorrect or wrong is from me and shaytan, and Allah and his messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi.